Here we go. Okay, and now I do the call. And then I'm calling the uh, meeting of the Governance Organization Legislation Committee to order um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access, access and the proceedings in real time via technological means. This meeting is being recorded and, and I'm gonna call on each uh, member of the committee to make sure they can hear and be heard. So with that, I'm gonna call on uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. And Jennifer Taub. Present. And I am present. So um, I guess we're getting started on my maiden voyage. I'm a little nervous. Um, Shalini is here. She was in the audience. I just brought her in. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Shalini. I've asked Shalini as co-sponsor of the proposed special act to, to be here this morning, and we've moved that to the first item on the agenda because she could be here at this time. Where uh, I'm also moving a, the agenda around a little bit. After the special act, we'll look at very briefly get an update on the obstruction of public ways. And then we'll move into the Tibetan proclamation and the COVID-19 resolution that was added to your pack, packet late, uh, but it's uh, pretty clear. I'm not going to uh, bring up the child abuse. We're going to postpone that till our next meeting because it's not due to be uh, uh, go out until uh, April. So we're fine on that. And I'd like to save the time. We'll do the adoption or uh, of the minutes. Then we'll, if there are public here, uh, we will have public comment before we go into a beginning discussion on the rules of procedure. Uh, then we will have our discussion. But I have a feeling that most of the public comment, I could be wrong, will be about rules of procedure. Um, so with that, uh, I'm calling the meeting to order at 9.33. I think I should have done that in the first sentence. <laughs> okay. Um, Shallon and I, and I have been wrestling uh, with this issue, and I definitely want you to speak in, in a, we have the proposed act, as you see it, was written by Robert Ritchie, uh, who was the town council uh, at that time, you know, uh, instead of KP Law. It uh, has been used several times. We don't feel it needs to go to legal review. Uh, and it basically is asking permission to the state legislature for an extension of lawful uh, permanent residents' ability to vote in Amherst. Um, and I don't think I need to, we need to go into justification uh, unless there are questions about that. But what we are trying to figure out is whether we need more language. Anna brought that up. We've uh, our original decision, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong or misinterpreting Chalonet, was that we would leave it as it is because we're going to be creating the bylaw after we have permission for the special act. And in that instance, we want to make sure not only can people vote in um, municipal elections, but they can be on town committees, which I believe has already happened and more importantly, perhaps run for elected office, or whether it's the school committee, town council. So we want to extend all rights. Um, so we're debating within ourselves whether we need language, and we really would like your input or thoughts on that. Shalini? So and I did. Mandy. Yes, thank you for this opportunity, um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, what I did clarify on the town website was that if you are a registered voter, then you're also allowed to run for election. And I think that was the point that Anna was raising is that not only should they be allowed to vote, but they should be allowed, like, I was able to run for council. So I think that is uh, already exists. Okay, so are, are you therefore saying you're fine with the language as is? I am. Okay, thank you, Shalane. Mm -hmm. Mandy? 
Yeah, um, I have one question and then one one request regarding that that I think would would alleviate some of our concerns, <laughs> um, of, or at least Anna's concerns that that deals with the word registered. So I'll make that one first. I wonder if we could add the word registered, you know, on this fourth line on a list of voters established by the town clerk. If we add the word on a list of registered voters established by the town clerk. Um, just to be clear, because and, and my reasoning is I worry that without the word in the special act, someone could challenge it and say, even if we put it in the bylaw, we went beyond what the special act allowed because the special act didn't say they would be registered voters, they'd just be voters and the registered list is the state voting list, say, you know, um, that that and this would at least potentially minimize that sort of argument from someone that says the municipal list isn't the registered voter list, the state list is for purposes of mm -hmm. whatever. Um, the question I have is, there are a number of other communities that have sought special acts. And so I'm curious how close our language here is to the language of other communities. Do they basically, you know, when I when Anna and I did the transfer fee, they're all over the place. Are, the, are these ones all over the place or or are they all basically the same thing? Go ahead, Shalini. Yes, yeah, so we I looked at uh, or we looked at Northampton in particular, and then I also looked up at Cambridge. And so the Northampton one does not mention a list. It just says, and that's one way we could just get out of that whole problem is to get rid of that one line. Well, I think it would read fine if it said who reside in um, legal perm. So going back to what we have, basically it would be legal permanent resident non-citizens who reside in Amos may upon application uh, thereafter vote in any Okay, so it'll be something like that. Okay, so the Northampton language is that for voting every resident of the city or in the case of an election for ward councilor or ward committee member, every resident of the ward, whether a citizen or not citizen who is not otherwise disqualified from voting under state law shall be qualified to vote in all preliminary elections, special elections and regular city elections. So basically they're going by the negative, like whereas we say like, uh, any all legal um, permanent residents, non-citizens, they have taken the opposite approach, the negative, which is that anyone who is not disqualified is allowed to. The other thing uh, is that Wayland and, and several of the other uh, towns, this the language that we have here is basically the language that they also use. So I feel really comfortable. I do feel like we should be adding uh, the uh, list of registered voters established. That feels to me uh, kind of important. Um, Michelle, you worked on this initially with us. Do you have anything that you're thinking about or wanted to look at? I think, thanks for asking, Pat. Um, what Mandy had asked about other municipalities was going to be my question. So I, you've you've answered that. And otherwise, I think keeping it simple is great. And um, so I have no, no further suggestions right now. Thank you, though. Thank you. I believe then, are there any other questions or issues that anyone wants to bring up about this? Otherwise, we can take a vote. Um, on whether we can recommend this to the council as clear, consistent, and actionable. Mandy? My my question was just, are we on a, are we just a clear, consistent, consistent and actionable review, or are we a substantive review too, such that our, it depends, it, that changes the motion. That's all. Okay. Uh, restate the motion with the substantive, because we okay. did look at that. Yes. Lynn, did you have a question before I do a motion? Uh, so I, I'll make them, I'll move to um, recommend the town council adopt the proposed special act, an act authorizing extending local voting rights for lawful permanent residents residing in the city known as the town of Amherst as amended and declare and further declare it clear, consistent and actionable. Okay. Second. Are, are we keeping this? line here or not yes you're keeping it yes i'm sorry yes we are the, i think the only amendment is that registered edition 
Is that... Did I read it slow enough, Erica? <laughs> Can you read that one more time? Sure. I move to recommend the town, town council adopt the proposed special act, an act authorizing extending local voting rights for lawful permanent residents residing in the city known as the town of Amherst as amended and further to declare it clear, consistent, and actionable. Second, DeAngelis. Can I do that? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. And Chalene, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it very much. We have to vote, Pat. <gasps> can, I, <laughs> can I Did just you want to say something first? Can I just ask a clarifying question very quickly? And maybe so the registered voters is the same as because I'm looking at Cambridge City and they also have their names entered on a list of voters. Uh, established by the Elections Commission for the city of Cambridge. So I'm just wondering that is that the same as registered voters? Okay, fine. Yeah. All right, we're good then. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Um, Michelle? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. I'm an aye. And Lynn? Oops. Aye. Okay, wonderful. Pass unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank it will be all. on, it will now be on the agenda for the 27th. Right. And that motion will include filing it with the legislature. Okay. Right. And we have uh, a really good support from um, Mindy and from Joe Cumberford. And we're also going to be combining our requests with other towns that are reapplying also. So we hope that will move the legislature. All right. With that, I'm going to uh, move to. Uh, Bye, all. Thank bye, you. bye, Shalini. Sorry. Thank you again. Um, I'm going to um, ask if there's any update on the uh, snow, the obstruction of uh, public ways, bylaw three four, formerly known as snow and ice. Um, we have we were hoping to hear back from get, to get comments from the DPW, uh, and we have not. I have one small item. But if the, I'd love to know if anybody has any information, Mandy, you have not heard back yet. So we, you're muted, Mandy. I'm trying to. No, I have not heard back from them. And that assumes that then you haven't either since you were on that email I, where we requested. So right. I sent it, when I sent it to Pat, I sent it to at the request of Guilford to Guilford for DPW. And he thought also Rob Mora since Rob would be added to this and his department would be added to it, that he might want to see it. So I sent it to both of them too, um, asking that they respond to Pat with any requests yeah. and all. I did have a brief conversation with Guilford at the UMass event about this, if you want me to summarize that. Yeah, that would be lovely. I mean, he wanted to see it, but he thought it was a good move, basically, um, to put D, you know, he was okay with putting DPW on there. Let's just say okay. that, um, that he wasn't sure how it would work to actually write the non-criminal dispositions um, since DPW tends not to write tickets basically, mm -hmm. um, but he thought it was a good idea. And he also thought it was a good idea to add other obstructions. He actually indicated that he thought it used to have obstructions other than snow and ice oh, in it. Um, and so he just wanted to see the language basically, um, but he seemed to, when I summarized what we were trying to do, agree with the purpose and the goals we were aiming for. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I'm gonna ask uh, for help here. Should we uh, wait to hear anything more formal or do we want to take a vote on recommending this to the council? And, Jennifer, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, I usually don't use my town computer and I'm starting to use it and I, the mute button. Anyway, so <laughs> did I understand from what Mandy just said that Guilford wants to see it before we approve it? So he asked to see it, yes. And so I sent it off to him. We have oh. not heard back from him. So he, right. he has a copy oh, he of has it. it. Okay. Yes. We just haven't heard back from him. But when I described the goals and what we were aiming for, he expressed support for that. But we haven't formally heard back from him after he's seen the actual language I drafted. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. So what do we think? <laughs> so um, Athena, what do you think about whether we should wait or go forward with a vote and recommendation? Um, that's a good question. I think it's probably a good idea to hear from Robin Guilford, um, but that could happen after GOL makes a recommendation. We could ask them to look at it before the council looks at it. So it's, I mean, potato, so we have potato. if you want to wait and make a recommendation after you hear from them, or if we want to make sure that what GOL recommends is okay with Robin Guilford before the council acts on it, I think you could do that either way. Yeah, it sounds like we have tentatively an idea that they're saying, yes, this is a good thing. I'd like to move forward because I was on the orig original bylaw review committee, and <laughs> this has been going back now four years. Uh, and I think that the changes that have happened to this are really excellent changes. Um, so I would like to go forward with whether or not we're recommending this as clear, consistent, and actionable. Mandy, is there anything else I should be saying in that? It would also be the substantive to adopt. Okay. So we find the substantive review too. Okay, and because I'm nervous about doing this for the first time, I'm gonna ask you to pose the motion. So it's the same one as the last one. So it would be to <laughs> recommend the town council adopt the revisions to general bylaw 3.40 snow and ice um, comma renamed obstruction of public ways and further to declare it clear, consistent and actionable. Thank you. Is there a second? Second Miller, I also have a question if that's okay. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, oh, yes, I do too. So go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'm just wondering because it is, it does include more now and, um, the title has been changed. Is there some way that we would want to alert, like, how does the communication with the public happen in a circumstance like this? Right. It's, and that, that's a really good question. And it was brought up by a couple of different people. I think that we need to, we would need to announce it at, uh, public meetings, and also that we would send out something via the town website. Is there anything else that we can do to notify the public? Because now it's not just snow and ice, which we're not seeing, um, but uh, tree limbs and, and or bushes and things like that. Uh, Jennifer? We could, you know, let our districts know. That we right, in our district meetings and newsletters, etc. Yeah. Is that, how does that does that answer your question, Michelle? Yeah, those are all great ways, definitely. Okay. Pat, if I may. Yes, please. The bylaw changes need to be posted on the town bulletin board for 14 days, and then the council has to read them twice. So, um, oh, so oh, good, good. So we'll have an opportunity to hear from people during that time too, as long as they look at the website. So good mm -hmm. idea to share it with constituents as well. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, two two questions. I should have raised this earlier. I I am concerned about taking the word snow and ice out of the title, and wondered if it should say snow comma ice comma and other obstructions of public way, so that if somebody's doing a word search, the word snow and ice are still there. That I saw Jennifer's thumb go up, and I, yeah. <laughs> so can we do a quick consensus on that? I would feel comfortable with that. Mandy, anybody? That's fine with me. Yeah, so thumbs up is fine, I believe. So, okay, so that passes that uh, friendly amendment or whatever it is. I will get better at this. Uh, that's, thank you, Lynn. And the only other thing I had was in number one, B1, uh, it shall be treated in the very last sentence. Uh, it talks about treating sidewalks, so treated with sand or otherwise. And that just bothered me. Uh, and But that's how the original bylaw was as well. So I was wondering whether or not uh, we wanted to add salt or grit, which were things that are put on the sidewalk. But I don't, I don't know if it's very important. Lynn and then Mandy. Uh, my question actually is uh, when we'll bring this to the council, but let's get the other questions answered. Okay. 
Mandy? My, mine didn't apply to that. It was just for Athena. Um, you change, please change the title and the penalties for violations of that. That yeah, that part just to make it the same as the title. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So sand, salt, grit, or otherwise, we could do that. I I don't think it. Well, if it's otherwise is correct, it's just awkward for me. Uh, we can just leave it alone. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Okay, anything else? So, uh, did we vote? <laughs> okay, so it's been moved and seconded. So we're going to start with Michelle Miller. Aye. Okay, Jennifer. Aye. Uh, I'm an aye. Lynn. Aye. And Mandy. Aye. So that passes unanimously. So my question is to Athena. It must be posted 14 days before the final vote of the council or 14 days. So we can take this up for the first time on the 27th and the second time on March 6th. Okay, thank you. Mandy, Joe, you have your hand up. Mandy, you may speak. The chair recognizes you. <laughs> that was a lingering hand. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to move us into the Tibetan proclamation. And right now, I believe I'm listed as the only sponsor, but I am open for other counselors to join us. Just a minute, Lynn. Lynn? Yes, I would also like to continue to be a sponsor as I have every year and also mention that there will be an event on the 10th, which is the day, and hopefully counselors will be there to help read the proclamation. Yeah, it's a very moving, uh, very simple ceremony, but very moving. So I encourage everyone to come. Is there anyone else here who would like to be a sponsor? So I'm checking, hold on. I thought Shalini perhaps was. Um... I, I'm, I'm, che oops. Um, I'm checking uh, to see if I have any other. I, yes, I know Shalini is in the group. Okay. Um, and Michelle, were you part of it last year, last year? I do believe I sponsored it last year, um, but I'm okay. Well, Thank you're you. more than welcome to be on it, I think. Um, Pam so Shalini is a sponsor as well. Yeah, yes. Pam Rooney is also a sponsor. Um, uh, Shalini, yeah, that's it. Right, and the... Uh, What's the name of the group? The Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, and the, the, um, the version you have has a question raised by Angela, who has worked very closely with this group. Um, and- Did you make that larger? She wondered if we wanted to just eliminate this or do a substitute um, and talked about cause and effect. Right. One of the things that I feel very strongly is that it's, I don't feel comfortable including the Thermo Fisher Scientific um, US yeah. companies, including naming a company. I am. I don't want this removed, um, but I want. To, I want to hear from other people as well, as well, because of what is happening uh, and how this DNA collection um, is being used to uh, control populations and move people, and uh, it's really targeting um, Buddhist monks um, and. If, if, and they're using it. They're saying it's a tool to fight crime. Uh, find missing people and ensure social st uh, stability. 
But without checks on police powers, they're really using this database in any way that they see fit. Um, and I strongly urge us to just remove the whole paragraph. No. Because the company's named? Yeah, and because when you start getting into DNA and stuff, I, I just feel I, a little uncomfortable. Well, I, I don't, uh, well, we're not doing this in a very orderly way. Before I speak again, is there anyone else who wants to say something about this? Michelle, and then Mandy. Um, is so this was put in by the community sponsors. Is that yes, it was. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And do we have anyone of the community? No, the community sponsor is not here today. No, I wasn't able to reach him yesterday. Uh, but I was anything that we decide, will I'll pass by him before. Okay. He, I guess I was just wondering if we're doing a clear, consistent, and actionable like we would normally do, or if we're doing a substantive, because it sounds more like, I guess, Lynn, I would, I'm just wondering if you wanted to remove it in terms of our clear, consistent, and actionable, is it, where does it fit in within that? I think that's a very good question, and it really goes beyond that, so it's. Um, okay, Mandy? Uh, Michelle, are you finished? Yes, I am. Okay, Mandy and then Jennifer. Yeah, um, so it's kind of a combination of that. I'll address this paragraph particularly, but I have some comments on the other stuff that could be considered both, but they're just comments um, depending on what paragraph we're on. But for this one, one of the consistency issues is that it's two sentences and our whereas clauses are generally kept to one <laughs> sentence. So um in that sense, we would be modifying it no matter what to combine into one sentence or delete a sentence or add it as a separate whereas clause or something because mm -hmm. what we do in GOL is keep each whereas to generally one sentence. Um, I am not aware of a single um, proclamation where we've targeted or named specific companies in the past in general in this way. Um, I don't think we've faced, I'm not sure we've faced that before though. And so that, I guess that goes to sort of our definitions of what is actionable or not. Um, and I don't know whether that is, I, I don't think we've talked about that in GOL when faced with something like that is to what to do with the naming of companies like in proclamations like this. Um, I, I will say I am I am concerned about the naming of a specific company um, without any proof or any inclusion of any, you know, we've had proclamations before, Michelle, you, you're aware of like the Silas Sibylin ones where we were provided a huge amount of information that supports um, what was in there. We haven't been provided that. So I just have some concerns about that. But at a minimum, I think it is within GOL's purview to combine them into one sentence. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I just, I, this, I feel uncomfortable and I felt this with the plant-based medicine proclamation at times that I just, this is the first I'm learning of this. So I just don't hmm. feel, you know, I just would need some more information. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't know how to, kind of respond. I mean, it, it may be and likely is valid. I just don't, I'm, I'm not coming from any kind of informed position on this. Yeah. I did go on and look at uh, Citizen Lab and get some information from them. Um, but I'm, I'm hearing that there seems to be pretty much a consensus of not including that this year. Um, because it, number one, removing the name of the company. I think we all agree on that. The other thing is it does seem that the majority of people here are uncomfortable with it. Um, and I would not oppose removing it. Um, I think the, some of the reasons cited have been good ones. Are um, you suggesting removing the whole thing? Yeah. 
And yeah, yeah. Um, I believe Angela raised this because I, how many days are we allowed to fly any flag? Athena, do you know that? I thought it was 10 days. I, I don't think that's really changed, has it? I don't think so. Yeah. We've flown flags for months at a time. I mean, right. the Ukraine yeah. flag is still up. And I, I, in this one, I don't know what we normally do, whether it's just one day, but this, the 10 days was there last year. Yeah. And it, it, we flew it for more than one day. Yeah. So I think the 10 days works fine. I, mean, I don't, I don't have any problem with this at all. And it's part of our celebration. Um, and furthermore, we're going to probably by raising, yeah. So do we need to take a formal vote on this or are we comfortable that we've reached a consensus in the committee about removing it? You need to take a vote. Okay. So um, again, Mandy, I'm going to ask you to pull. Oh, I, I have other requested changes. Okay, let's go to those first. <laughs> I'm not done with the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, you're probably going to talk about the three that were taken out. Um, so, so there's a couple things. So the third whereas clause is also two sentences. Last year's proclamation fixed that. So the we have language from last year's proclamation that um, was signed into the reciprocal yeah. act. So last year's proclamation that that whereas clause read. On December 19, 2018, the Reciprocal Access to Tippet Act, parens, sponsored by Representative Jim McGovern and parens, was signed into law, comma, calling for an end to China's isolation of Tibet and providing American citizens, comma, including Tibetan Americans in Amherst, comma, with the same opportunity of access to Tibet as enjoyed by Chinese citizens visiting our country, parent, uh, semicolon, and. So I know I read that too fast, Athena. Um, but it, it that's how we reworded it. It's in the 2022 proclamation right, it is. that way. Right. Um, so if you just pull, yeah. And that solves the two sentence issue there. Yeah. Um, and before that paragraph or, and then there were three whereas clauses from last year removed. And so I guess my question is to the sponsors, why? Is that something the Regional Tibetan Association asked to remove? All I know is that Angela, we sent this to them. Angela spoke with them and they came back with the change as you see it. Right. So whether right. they actually consulted with the Regional Tibetan Association, I don't know. But they, they generally are a consultative group. Yes, they are. Uh, I think one of the reasons, and I'm making an assumption here, is that there we don't know. How, it says over a million Tibetans have lost their lives in the past six uh, decades. That number may be increased. Um, and but I would very much like to keep that the Chinese invasion has disrupted the culture of Tibetans and also the snow lion flag. Um, design because it is a symbol of unity uh, and it's important. Um, so I would like to add those two back. Um, so I can read them off again, um, but you know, that's the question is as sponsors, you can do what you want. Um, I'm not sure it's appropriate for us, but Athena just put them up um, right. of the three that were removed. Um, is that where they appeared in the last- They appeared after the, um, they, they appeared, came after one million. Yes, that's where they appeared last year. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then my last comment is in the now therefores and the last whereas. The last whereas is the same as last year's whereas. Um, I'm surprised we didn't catch it last year. That the the sentence, the members of the regional Tibetan association seems more proper as a now therefore clause than as a whereas clause. The celebration yes, part. We tend to put it in now therefore is not in whereas is. It was in the where it, this this whereas yeah. clause is the same as it was last year, but it seems like we tend to move those flag raising ceremonies issues as now therefores. Um, 
And I would move that now, therefore, to the second one. After the council? After the first now, therefore. Um, and th that now, therefore, this is a proclamation, not a resolution. So I think we should delete the be it hereby resolved that. Right. So it reads now, therefore, the town council of the town of yes. Amherst in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I think it's then recognizes the local Tibetan American community's plea for justice. So in, in the first now, therefore, just remove, be it hereby resolved that. Yes. And, oh, and continues to proclaim or not, and, and continues. So, so there's a continue down the fourth line would be and continues to proclaim each March 10 as Tibet Day and further oh, recognizes. Right. Oh my gosh, we really didn't see that last year. No, we didn't, right? And further recognizes the fourth, fifth line, this proclamation right. by raising the flag. Right. And further, I think it's further to pay tribute to the next, the last paragraph would be a further. And further or and further, instead of a now therefore, it would be and further. So instead of there, okay. So the tribute to the 154 self emulated um, would be a now, say that again, Mandy. No, I think that, I think it's right now. That would also be a now therefore? No, it's it's appropriate, right? As it is, as it is this way. No, I'm confused because you talked about moving it below it is town. below oh i'm not, i'm looking at my paper and not the screen I apologize. <laughs> i'm so sorry yes okay and lynn are you comfortable with these changes i am yeah and, and jennifer i don't remember if you're a sponsor or michelle and i'm comfortable with these okay. changes and i will take the responsibility of contacting uh, the president of the group to let them know that we've removed that one paragraph on why. Thank you for doing that, Pat. Okay. Any other questions or concerns about this? I think you should also make sure that they know we added those three back in too. Yeah. I'm going to figure out how to take this out after you're done with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we trust you on that. Um, okay. And add our header. I'll add the town's header. Yeah. So I'm, um, uh, would someone make a motion to determine that this is, uh, we are recommended this to the town council as clear, consistent, and actionable as amended? I can make one if you um, pull Go ahead, it up. Michelle. I can yeah, look at that. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me look at the title on my um, computer. <laughs> uh, I haven't pulled up. I thought I did. Um, oh, goodness. If you go to the top, there you go, Michelle. It's right there. I'm Thank you. Screen. Okay. <laughs> Um, to move uh, to declare the 2023 Tibetan National Uprising Day proclamation clear, consistent, and actionable. Second. As amended. Is there a second? Hold second. A second, but oh, as there. amended. Ah, uh, excuse me. Yes, as amended. <laughs> and and I a seconder. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> We still have to vote, Pat. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault because you didn't, weren't able to continue. All right. <laughs> I'm going to start with Mandy Jo Haneke because in the rotation, I skipped her last time. Aye. Michelle? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. I'm an aye. Lynn? Aye. And it's unanimous. Oh, if the day could only go this way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, when we open the meeting, uh, I'm uh, not going to work on the child abuse um, proclamation right now. Um, and we will take that up on our first meeting. 
our next meeting. But I would like to move to the COVID Remembrance Day uh, because it's time sensitive. Uh, now, every all the counselors received this um, in the in your email um, from Jennifer Ritz Sullivan, who is uh, the COVID justice leader for uh, Mark by COVID Massachusetts. Um, and I, do you want that name again? Yeah, can you? I, I was yeah. just going to, to find the spelling. Okay, it's Jennifer Ritz, R-I-T-Z, Sullivan, no hyphen. Thank and you. she is a COVID justice leader. were marked by COVID. Massachusetts. And again, we're looking for sponsors for this uh, resolution. And I'm I'm yeah, happy you're the only sponsor that has come forward, but certainly right. others who are here should speak up. Okay. All right. So um, I think it's pretty uh, direct and self-evident. Um, there, this is uh, one of the important things is that uh, Mindy Dom and um, Natalie Blaze uh, have in, uh, reintroduced legislation HD three eight two one, calling for a COVID remembrance day on the first Monday of March. Um, and uh, and this is also um, this idea is being supported at the federal level by all nine congressional le uh, legislators in the Massachusetts uh, in the House and um, both Senator Warren and Markey introduced the legislation in the Senate. So I feel like we are supporting those actions, um, and I would love to get uh, questions, comments, concerns from the group. And I don't know whose hand was up first, so I'm going to go with Lynn because that's how it um, is on my screen. Um, so the I, I hate to change something that has come from you know a group like this, but I think when it said su says Survivors Memorial Day, it confused for me. It confuses it with Memorial Day, and mm -hmm. I it, I wish it said Remembrance Day, but maybe we don't want to mess with that. Um, then down below on the paragraph where there's supposed to fill in numbers, um, this is a becomes a guessing game. Um, and I am trying to figure out how or are looking at this, whether we can just recognize um, that more that many people's people worldwide and in the United States, have lost their lives due to COVID-19 and maybe. And what well, we could say in Amherst alone. I, I don't know that we have a correct number. Yeah. Maybe Mindy Jo has, you know, a number she feels comfortable with. Okay, thank you for bringing those issues up. Okay, and then under the now therefores where it says yeah that the mayor or city council, it should say that the town council. council. Right. Yeah. Okay, Mandy? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm gonna bring this out when we review the rules for some of my proposed rule changes, but this is an example of where, and, and I know Pat, you're the, the sponsor and, and you've got things going on, but where this isn't ready for a clear, consistent and actionable review. It's not our job as GOL to fill in the numbers. It's not our job to put town council there. It should have came to GOL with those numbers there. Um, we're not supposed to be filling in those numbers. Um, so I don't know what to do with it, right? Because I'm not a sponsor. I don't really want to sponsor this because I don't wanna put my time into it, but we can't send it on to the council like this because mm -hmm. um, it's not ready. Um, I do have one clear, consistent, and actionable thing beyond that concern to mention, which is the first whereas paragraph seems more logical 
to go towards the end of the um, resolution or whatever we call. Before the first now, therefore? Yeah, somewhere in there. I'm not sure where your sponsors you'd put it, but it just seems more logical to go not as the first whereas yeah. um, in terms of clarity because we hadn't defined the term yet and stuff like that or why March would be appropriate, but there's paragraphs afterwards that mm -hmm. get you to those points. Um, so those are my comments. Okay, and I'm gonna take Lynn's questions, comments before, and then Michelle before I respond, go ahead. Lynn? Um, please take Michelle next. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate Mandy for bringing up that point. And um, I think that, is it possible for us to approve it and with some language that acknowledges that the sponsors will add the fill in the blank pieces that need to be filled in here. It sounds like maybe a little research needs to be done to answer some of these highlighted areas. Is that right, Pat? Well, it's interesting because um, I'm gonna say they're not needed. I felt comfortable with, I think it was Lynn saying, uh, whereas more, you know, um, people worldwide and, and, you know, or hundreds of people worldwide or whatever, uh, a more generalized thing. Um, I feel comfortable with that. The reason this is here in an unfinished state is because it was gotten, just came to us. And the only meeting we have really is that, um, I believe is the uh, 27th of February. So we would go past this March 10th date before the council could vote on it. So I agree with uh, sponsors in this instance myself um, being more prepared. I have no problem with that, but I think there was a reason that it was less prepared. So I'm gonna suggest to the sponsor that we uh, do whereas millions of people worldwide and mm -hmm. in the United States have lost their lives to the deadly COVID-19 virus, period. And I totally agree with Mandy Joe's suggestion, it's something that um, I will get to as we go to the rules. Right. Um, and due to the deadly COVID-19 virus. And take out up above to, to where it says, uh, I don't think you want to take out do. Millions of people worldwide and in the United States have lost their lives due to COVID-19. No, it should say do take out to COVID-19 because it's in there twice now. Okay, yes. To, oh, I see, yes. Okay, and I do we put the word the before town council, that the town council? I don't know. I, I think we tend to. Yeah, we do. Um, and the last whereas needs the period instead of the semicolon and. And does there need to be after now therefore virus comma and or not? I again I'm I have to be honest and say I I'm not as I haven't been focusing on this at the level that you all have been. Thank thank you for all of this. Okay. So the last be it therefore the resolve should have urges instead of urge. All right. And the first now, therefore, should have a period, not a comma at the end. Thank you. That resolves. This feels like the old GOL. This is what And the projected did. cost, none should be deleted. Yep. And then signatures added. Yep. Right. And, and we were, and we moved the uh, first one, the first whereas, just before the now, therefore, and that was agreed. Okay. Michelle has her hand up. Yep. Michelle? Could you just scroll up a little bit here, whoever's managing that? 
Oh, okay. Never mind. Perfect. Okay. So I guess we're at a place where we are voting on recommending in, to the town the council. Motion. We're making a motion to recommend to the town council um, that the COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day resolution is clear, consistent, and actionable as amended. Second. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to vote yes on that. Lynn? Yes. Mandy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Okay. Thank you for the work you had to put in on that. Um, and I will contact Jennifer Ritz Sullivan to, um, today, too. Okay. Uh, oh, I would like to make um, a motion that we adopt to go to the adoption of minutes from our last meeting on February 1st. So I'd like to move that uh, to adopt the February 1st, 2023 minutes as presented, unless there are concerns or changes uh, put forth by any members of the committee. Second. Okay. Uh, any? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, vote uh, to move to um, adopt the tw uh, February 1st, 2023 minutes as presented. Second. Uh, okay, yeah. Mandy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Uh, I'm an aye, and Lynn? Aye. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do now is to um, have break for public comment. I'm not sure how many. Are there any attend? There are no. I'm really surprised. Real quick, who seconded that amendment? I mean, oh, uh, that. Uh, I'm sorry. Lynn Griesmer did. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. No. Yell at us at any moment. Break into us at any moment that you need something. Um, so what I would like to do now, since we don't have uh, any attendees, is to move to close um, and begin a discussion of changes and uh, concerns about the rules of procedure. I'd like to do it in a, sort of a cluster way. We have a very hard stop in an, at 10 at 11:30. So wherever we are, we are stopping that. And the discussion of the rules of procedure will continue uh, at our next meeting. So there, there are several ways to do it. One, we could just go page by page by page, or what I, uh, we could start with some of the very simple ones first and see if we can get through those. Um, and Michelle, I saw your hand go up and then Jennifer. Yeah, quickly, just I have a future agenda item. So I was just uh, making sure you'd bring that up toward the end before the 1130 hard stop. Okay, why don't you give us that future agenda item now? Sure. Um, I was hoping that I can get my act together to put together a Women's History Month proclamation. Um, and so looking at the timing, Women's History Month is in March. Um, it would have to be on next meetings agenda to make it, I think, for the March 6th uh, town council meeting. Okay. All right. I have that um, note to myself. Thank okay. You. And I'll keep you posted too, Pat. Thank you very Thank much. You. Jennifer? Uh, just real quickly, I, I a space that we were starting at 930 today. I actually tuned in at nine. I have an 1130 meeting, so I may have to cut off like two minutes early. That absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, we voted last time to move the meeting yeah. to 930. My mistake. Um, no, no, no problem. Um, so uh, there are there are a couple of things with the rules and procedures. We got uh, questions or issues brought up by uh, counselors. And we also have uh, 
uh, the document that has some red line changes and ideas and requests. So um, some of the uh, counselor comments that came in, uh, I'm not sure whether I understand each one of those. Some of them are pretty clear, but what I, what I would like to do is if people feel comfortable doing some minor changes before we move into more complex issues. Does that feel comfortable to people? Okay, well then I'd like to go forward and um, and anyone has any very specific, very simple changes. I have listed uh, one, two, three, four or five that I think are very simple and direct that we can do very easily. Um, so I guess I'll just start with that. And if we, you know, in terms of the introductory pages and the, uh, uh, that those need to be changed and updated, but the first change would be to 1.4. Uh, and you can see the change highlighted in red and it's our page uh, one, not the, yeah. No, uh, that's 2.1, yeah. 1.4, you can see it's a very simple change. Uh, the rules of um, rules of order newly revised, and it said eleventh, and now needs to say twelfth edition. And do I see any disagreement about changing that? Can we just uh, okay? So we have consensus on that. And I'd like to um, let me see where did I put that uh, to page three. Yeah, and here, where there is one simple change. So before we get to 2.1, the election of officers, which I think is gonna require more discussion, I'd like us to go to where uh, both um, sections three and four, where the word brief has been taken out in each one of those. Is there any, if they would like to make a statement of up to two minutes long, uh, it's taking out the word brief in both of those. Is that anybody uncomfortable with that? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's unanimous agreement. And um, let me see, page 30, the participatory budget. I know it's a, a scroll down, sorry, Athena. Okay, and on page 30, the, where it has uh, section B, then, uh, I'm sorry, the president shall appoint one counselor to serve on the participatory budgeting commission. And that has no, no longer exists. So that sentence could just come out. Mandy? Yeah, um, I propose this. I can explain it if people have questions about it, but I realized that I didn't propose the deletion of the letter A that Athena just highlighted. Um, that there's no need to have that A there then. So Athena's on top of it. <laughs> yeah, thank God somebody is. <laughs> is there any issue with this or can we reach consensus on this? Okay. Okay, thumbs up. Yeah, putting the thumb up, just like Michelle did, is always helpful just to make sure that I'm not. Then the other one that I think is rather simple uh, is on page 32, Appendix A. And we've had, now, uh, yeah, now on, on this one, Athena, I'm not sure what you're saying on the healthy balance one. And the, I'm having trouble seeing what you're putting up on the screen. So we had. There was no change to the healthy balance when it was just a. I didn't think so. Formatting. Okay. And then the next one, which would be, I believe, an addition is to lead with uh, curiosity. And, and this is the first time I'm seeing replace judgments and automatic automatic reactions with. Let me see how. I'm sorry, I have to use paper. Is are you crazy? Curiosity. <laughs> Lead with curiosity, replace judgments and automatic reactions with curiosity and seeking to understand the different perspectives 
before responding. Does anybody have trouble with that being included or its grammatical structure or anything else? Uh, and so if we're in agreement about adding that to this section of town council statement of values, please give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or you don't care. Okay. All right, those are, I think, the easy ones. Um, um, I think we need to form, do we need to form a motion that adopts those? Or are we going to wait till the end and have an entire a motion for everything? Michelle, I mean, Athena, what do you think? Mandy has her hand up. Okay, Mandy. I, I'm willing to make that motion. Um, so, so it would be um, to recommend the town council adopt revisions to rule 1.4, rule 2.1.D3, rule 2.1.D4, rule 10.6, and Appendix A as presented. Okay, second. So let's uh, vote, take the formal vote on that. Oh, no, Jennifer? I just want to ask, so I don't think it's included the part as I, about um, the, the, the meeting, the council meeting before the election of officers the second year, that wasn't here. Okay, I just want to make sure. No, we we're just doing that. really small right. things. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah, that's the only thing in this motion. So I'm going to start um, with uh, Mandy. I may be out of the sink. Hi. But, okay. And Michelle? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Lynn? Aye. And I'm an aye. So. Now I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that it, what I would like to do now is to go back in and uh, pick up uh, the more uh, substantive issues. But I'm also trying to look at um, some of the suggestions that came in um, that are not in the document, like is there a way to prepare public and council before emotional sensitive topics, uh, non-resident voters, uh, not non-resident voters, the uh, non-voting members of finance committee, uh, including resident members on TSO and CRC. Uh, I'm not sure where, where or how to take these up uh, in this process, so I wouldn't mind some advice here. Um, Michelle? One suggestion might be for us to start with that document and have a discussion on each of those items and within those discussions, see where they might fit into the rules so that if we are moving them into the rules or adding something, we get everything onto one document and then we go through and do everything. That there's more than one way to do this, but that might be a good yeah, that's starting helpful. place. Yeah, that's helpful. Any other comment on that? Otherwise, I'm going to go with Michelle's. Uh, Mandy? Yeah, I, I think that works. I think for some of them, they're more of a charge issue than a rules issue. Um, and so identifying charge, because I know there's some rules also that affect charges too. So right. we might want to separate ones that would need charge amendments too. The GOL is required to review, review the committee's structure every year too. It's actually part of the rules. So right. Um, right. separating right. those that would, rules would change if charges changed X, Y, Z or vice versa for after we get through the rest of the rules might be good too. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and I don't know who brought up these issues, but if it, you know, I think that anyone is available here in the uh, committee to respond. The first one is there, um, Athena, could you pull that up? Okay, thank you. Is there a way to prepare public and council before emotional or sensitive topics by acknowledging the concerns of the different stakeholders involved and inviting curiosity and understanding as we move forward with the discussion? 
also reminding everyone to focus on policy and not make it personal about people. Um, it seems to me that uh, the um, to focus on policy and uh, not make it personal comes up later in rules and procedures. Um, but I guess I'm I'm open to people's reacting to this. And Mandy. Yeah, I agree that second comment is part of, I think, rule five or whatever yeah. it is regarding courtesy and conduct or public participation. And I don't know what we've rephrased it in terms of right. how we've named it, but that rule. The first part, um, I don't see how it goes into rules, right? Because each person on the council or public member has different sensitivities and react, you know, so, so I don't know how we could identify um, a consistent way of saying these are emotional topics, these are not, right? Um, because, and, and if we tried to do that, I think we would say, we would end up having to say nearly everything we do is an emotional topic because for some people, different things are really what trigger that that sensitive issue and so i i don't know how to do that and i don't know how i would do it within a rule so i'm not sure it's a rule thing personally but okay thank you michelle yeah i i agree with mandy there um and i think that we picked it up in the value about curiosity a bit so <clears throat> We have curiosity now um, within the rules and our values. So it seems like that might cover it. <laughs> Any other comment or concern? And is there agreement with um, well, reminding everyone to focus on policy and not make it personal is in rule five, I believe. So I think we can is there Jennifer? You look like you're pondering something intently. So, if you yeah, have, well, a I was just thinking. I mean, is this sort of like saying that you know the presiding officer would make a statement that? Yeah, I'm comfortable taking it out. I think that's <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. So I think we have consensus on that. Now, this expanding CRC and TSO to include uh, resident members. Uh, whether voting or not voting, I, you know, that would be a, that feels like a charge issue and not a rules issue. Am I in, in error about that? Uh, Lynn? You're muted, You're Lynn? Muted. Thank Lynn? you. Lynn, oh, there we go. Got okay. it. I'm, I'm not going to try to answer the question of if it's a charge or not. Um, I, I, first of all, I love the resident members of um, the finance committee, but I want to just ask Mandy Joe because that option I believe was raised in the charter itself. So if we were to add um, resident members to other committees, even GOL, is that inconsistent with the charter? So the charter says the president appoints all members of the committees, appoints members of all committees of the town council. Beyond that, um, the charter doesn't much you know, it says the town council shall determine its own standing or ad hoc committees. So it doesn't indicate how the membership of standing or ad hoc committees needs to be, as far as I know. Um, it does. The next one, the issue of finance is because finance is actually a mentioned committee in the charter mm -hmm. in section um, I'm trying to find it here, um, but I know we mentioned it's it. It's five, 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 uh, C, B, C, B. 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 Um, and, and that one says the finance committee 
of the town council. So it's a town council committee. And then the last sentence says, may include members of the public who shall have a voice but no vote in the finance committee's deliberation. Council rules shall address the appointments of such members. Um, so, you know, going on the council, the charter doesn't talk about non other council committees beyond the finance committee. We can make any of our ones we want, but it does specifically mention non members of the public non councillors for finance, and it does specifically say they will not have a vote by a shall. So let me be having been on the finance committee since its inception um let me just say that when we first did when we first added um non-voting members to the finance committee uh we did it with the idea that it was a trial basis and uh it's based on how the last three and a half or so many years have gone it's gone really really well and in fact, um, it the people who are the added members to the finance committee have contributed greatly to the conversation. Those people are selected by submitting CAFs. And then I believe it's this committee that makes the recommendation to the council yes. as to who uh, they would approve based on this. So if we consider this, I would like us to consider it on a trial basis. And the second thing is, I do not agree with giving them equal vote. I, I feel like they continue to be um, part of the committee. They continue to be part of the quorum of the committee, but I would stop with the issue of vote. The other thing is that if you add two to each of these, that's, that's okay. Then you'd end up with seven, which is fine. Finance, we have eight and it's fine. So that that's all my comments for the moment. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Mandy? Um, it sounds like we might be getting into a substantive discussion of this. I caution us with non-finance members, not because it might not be good, but the reason the council gets to a appoint the non-voting members of the finance committee is because the charter allows it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other committees are not mentioned in the charter in terms of being able to do that. And so the charter would require if we put non-resident members, non-voting members, or even resident members that have a vote on say CRC and TSO, the president per the charter would be the sole appointing authority. And so um, there may be ways to, to write rules about how the president makes that decision, sort of. You know, we could potentially write a rule that says, well, the council will have a committee that makes recommendations to the president on who to appoint. But in the end, the president has sole appointing authority under the charter for all members of council committees. Uh, no matter whether they're counselors or not counselors. Um, and beyond that, because of that, you can't really guarantee a three-year term for those people, I don't believe. I, I, I would want to hear KP Law's discussion on that, because if you change a president, given that the president has sole authority to appoint members, could the president just appoint a different member after a year by themselves? just like they could with a counselor, right? Um, in theory, a president could remove any counselor from a committee and put someone else on at any time, or if the presidency changes mid-year or at the change of a council completely. And so I, I think it's a wider discussion than for the non-finance committee than it is for finance because of how the charter is written. And those issues need to be thought through more than just, oh, it's working well on finance. Let's try it because of these other issues. Thank you, Mandy. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I just have a clarification question. So is what we're I'm hearing is that in order to 
have resident members of let's say TSO and CRC, it would require a charter change. No, we could do it. It's just the president has sole pointing authority. Right. Oh, the and council the reason it doesn't, but I'm saying authority. if the if the charter were to be changed, if we wanted it to be like finance committee, the, those resident members where it comes before GOL, that would require a charter change. Yes. Okay. Um, and so then can a charter change happen at any time or does it only when the charter's being reviewed at those 10 year? That's a good technically can happen anytime. Indy Joe, you want to it weigh in? It just on. has to follow state law or our charter. Um, that doesn't, the charter built in a regular review to make sure that review would happen, but state law provides provisions on how a charter can be changed. Yeah. I would agree that, um, and then I have another question. If So if, a, let's say the uh, president were to appoint and it was a three-year term, would that be a guarantee or two-year, whatever it was, it wouldn't be guaranteed if the president changed and more. Okay, right. I would be uncomfortable just in principle, <laughs> right. not reflecting our current president, having that be a, a present decision. I agree with Mandy Joe that. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I, I, I think I will just say, I believe it gives the president too much power. Yep. Yep. I, I, I'm, I really want to stress, I'm not objecting to non-voting residents being on other committees. That I feel has been enormously well received for finance. Yeah. But I, there's other issues here that have been raised that need to be worked out. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we not try to resolve this one today, that we, um, maybe have a set of questions like this that we are in fact going to ask KP Law and maybe we can even have them attend a GOL meeting. That sounds good to me. Anyone else commenting on that? Okay. Okay. I'm going to KP Law. Um, I feel like we we've temporarily uh, gotten through that with some things to check with KB Law. So the next one is finance, make finance resident voting. Um, the charter is permissive for non-voting, but does not say cannot vote. Rational expands expertise and longevity gives voices more equal weight. Can I? Man, uh, Mandy and then Michelle as it came up for me, just a minute. I, I disagree with that the charter is doesn't mention about non-voting. I mean, the language is the finance committee may include members of the public who shall have a voice, but no vote in the finance committee's deliberations. Mm -hmm. And so the way I read that is you, you can't have, if it includes members of the public, they have no vote with that shall. Like we don't have to put members of the public on, but if we do, they have no vote per the charter. Um, so I don't think we can do what this is asking, even if we wanted to, without changing the charter. Michelle? Yeah, that's very, very clear. Um, if what Mandy just read is in the charter, I think that um, maybe this person who suggested this didn't, didn't see that. Um, what I was going to say is, as a former member of the finance committee, I haven't seen, what I would think about is whether it would impact the engagement of the non-resident, or excuse me, the non-counselor resident member. And I have not seen that to be the case. Um, so I, I feel like at least in my time, the resident members have been extremely engaged and been able to provide a voice, an important voice, um, but given it's really not, um, it's a moot point, it sounds like. Lynn? Uh, and I totally agree with Michelle's observation. Uh, it's It's been really successful. Thank you. Yeah, and I agree with it as well. For my time on finance, uh, their voices were very valuable and they were looked to as equals. Um, so I feel fine leaving it the way it is. Man, uh, Athena and then Mandy. 
Um, please take Mandy's comment first. Okay, Mandy. I, I just wanted to say, and one of the workarounds that Andy as chair for the last four years has made that has made it successful is that he takes that straw poll of them. Um, so we get their non-vote, quote, vote, <laughs> however you want to call it. Um, even though it's not technically a vote, we do get to see whether they agree with the recommendation or not. Um, and that is is practically a vote, right? There's there's the committee has found a workaround around that mm -hmm. chart. Thank you. Athena? I was going to make the same point and suggest that if it was really important to the council to have that be part of the official process so that if a finance committee chair changes someday, um, that finance committee reports include um, support of resident members or something like that. I really like that. Yeah, I do too. And I'm going to ask uh, Lynn, as a member of the Finance Committee, to bring that up to the Finance Committee at your next meeting. Is that possible? Yep. That right. would be, it might also be a charge change. So I, I was going to say, I, yeah. I would think that might be in a charge, but let me bring it up to Andy. Okay. We're doing pretty well, I think. Um, He's, all right, let's get to, I've lost it. Here we go. Um, zoning. I'm going to require any proposed zoning change to go first to committee for discussion and analysis unless initiated by any of the following president and clerk of the, any of the following period. President and clerk should review motion wording to ensure that motion cannot override this path of committee first unless two thirds vote of council to expedite. And I feel, I would like to hold this one till we get um, to the larger discussion on uh, by zoning bylaws, so, you know, planning, zoning, things like that. Um, I'm being a little inarticulate here. Is there any reaction to holding that? Uh, I see a thumbs up. Yeah, because it's gonna be a big discussion. Okay, all right, so we're coming. Um, consider writing the next one. Uh, thank you, Athena. Consider writing three minute and courtesy stronger to allow debate, but permit the president to shorten if repetitive, same person. <laughs> and I'm believing this is not about public comment, which we, uh, we know by cause of freedom of speech can be as repetitive as it wishes. Um, we have many debates, I think, where uh, a, a counselor and this all of us contribute to this, uh, is repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, and, and it almost begins to feel like a fight maybe between two or three counselors or something like that. But I'm, I'm, um, I, I'd be interested in the suggestion and what, and how this would be written, but I'm also interested in comments from other counselors on this committee. Mandy? Yeah, I think this one bears further discussion, but when we get to that section of the rules, because there's a couple of proposed changes that this one kind right. of goes with. And so I think we should gather all those changes together and discuss sort of as a group so that we have a more holistic discussion. Yeah, and I'm seeing some nodding on that. So I'm gonna assume that we have some consensus and move on to the last one on this page. Permit submission of written statement and packet following a meeting if introduced with verbal summary during the meeting. This could include analysis or policy view. The written document cannot circulate before the public meeting and verbal summary. It, it must pertain to a topic under debate or consideration by the council during the posted meeting. This process also permitted for committee by members or counselors not on the committee who attend the meeting and provide public comments. Jennifer? Yes, I just have a question. Um, so is that the same as reading a statement into the record? I don't know the answer to that, Athena. I believe the intention with this suggestion is that a written statement be added to the packet after the meeting and that 
a summary would be read or spoken about during the meeting. Okay, so I have another question. If, if one wanted to read a statement into the record, you, you have it prepared, you read it during a, a meeting, whether it's a committee meeting or a council meeting, and then it's given to the clerk to submit as part of the record of the meeting? Is that correct? Pat, if I may. Please, oh, go ahead. That's not been our practice in the past. Um, the minutes include a summary of the discussion. So in the past, the minutes have said something like, you know, uh, counselor so-and-so read a statement in support of or opposition to and, you know, summarized their, their comments. Um, but I don't believe I've added the written statement to the packet. I think there's there was one instance when Paul read a statement um, at the most recent meeting about the July 5th incident, and that was included in the packet, but that's not, I don't recall a time that we've done that for counselor comments. So I guess I'm just asking, what is this? Is that is that what this is talking about? I don't know. Right, the suggestion is that if there's a summary of a written statement that the the entire written statement would be added to the packet after the meeting okay i'm going to go to michelle and then mandy and then lynn i can't say for sure but just based on some discussions i've had with counselors um it seems to me like a way to try to ensure that a person or a counselor's particular position is made available to the public given the confines of you know our ability to maybe post blog posts or or something like that it's like a way that if we have a particular position on something especially that might be ongoing that it makes its way into the public's eye somehow um i without this person being here i can't you know, say for sure, but that's sort of what I've gathered in discussions um, that I've had with other counselors. Thank you, Michelle. Mandy? Yeah, I was going to say something similar, but I, I in, in the, this issue has come up in the past in various places. Um, and, and I think it's not necessarily for the public always, um, but for other counselors, if someone feels like they've done a whole bunch of research and written up sort of a position paper that cites research and cites this and cites that, they want a way to um, get it into the packet and there hasn't been necessarily a consistent, uh, not consistent, I wouldn't say consistent, there hasn't necessarily been a clear manner of if you've done all of that or you have a long three page thing about you know x item we're talking about that poll position placement of a poll and you researched why that poll placement would be horrible and you know and you could go underground instead you know um that that and they wrote it up they don't have a way of distributing that right up to counselors and i think that's it's more of a counselor thing than a a public thing is how I interpreted it. Um, but but yeah, I think Michelle's sort of the same thing, right? Like what happens? Okay. Uh, Athena, do you want to jump in before Lynn? Uh, just a quick comment that say, for example, a counselor, a counselor could send articles or papers without their opinions to the entire council before or after a meeting. And if those were referred to during a meeting, then they would be included in the packet because they were used at the meeting. It's the opinion part that gets a little squirrely in terms of open meeting law. But it does sound like that there is a process actually but it hasn't been clearly defined so that every counselor knows what it I, is. I think the suggestion is about the opinion part. Yeah. Okay, Lynn and then Jennifer. Um, I, I think both uh, Michelle and Mandy Jo have, have interpreted um, the first part of this uh, as it is probably meant because it's certainly something I've heard from other counselors. Regarding that, I would like our rules to get much more clear 
about what can and cannot be circulated in advance and what can and cannot be added to the packet and the process after. So it, this might be a longer discussion. It might be when we get to that rule. At the same time, the last sentence in my mind, though connected, is a different question. And it is, how does a counselor who is not on a committee of the council raise issues to that committee for consideration? And again, I've heard this before, and I would like our rules to be very clear how this can be done. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I really feel these need to be addressed separately yeah. um, because they are in many ways, two separate issues. Okay. okay. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I'm glad this discussion is, is happening because I mean, I, so I'll just say there was at one time at CRC, I wanted to share something and I thought of asking that it be put in the packet, um, but, but I didn't know if that, so yeah, if you, since we can't, share something with the committee, all the committee members, unless it's publicly posted. If we wanna share something before a meeting, can we do that? Can we write something up and then ask Athena to have it go in the packet for the meeting? Athena? I just wanna express a little bit of concern about this conversation skirting the open meeting law and finding a way of doing this that avoids specifically violating the open meeting law <clears throat> rather than being really clear that opinions are shared during a meeting. That's what the meeting is for. This is my opinion. And that for committee meetings, counselors have an opportunity to speak during public comment at the committee meetings. And typically what our process has been in the past is that if counselors have specific comments about something that's in front of the committee, they send those to the chair and then raise them during the committee meeting. But I feel strongly that trying to thread the needle about avoiding an open meeting law violation is a slippery slope. And that's just my opinion, but I think opinions should be shared during a meeting. I appreciate that, Athena, Michelle, and then Jennifer. Yeah, I think some of the problem is just not having the time and um, in a meeting to to fully express, for example, what Mandy was saying. I'll give an an example. I have put together uh, sort of a some charts that I would like for the finance committee to look at. I've done some research. I've worked on it. I've put it together. Um, I'm, I'm not a member of the finance committee, and I agree that Lynn, this is a separate, a separate kind of piece of things. But um, you know, I think that one of the things as a counselor that we are tasked to do is to look at things critically, to do our research, to come prepared, and to be able to share what we learn with our colleagues. So I don't necessarily look at it as a way to circumvent the open meeting law, but rather, can we find a process um, that will allow for more information sharing between counselors, um, especially given we're working really hard to make our council meetings shorter, more efficient. Um, there's probably a lot that a counselor could say and take up a lot of time during me during a meeting that if it had been provided in writing, um, colleagues could look at it, you know, before or or after the meeting to gain a better, uh, more broad sense of what that counselor is trying to bring forward. Jennifer, yeah, I realize it may be veering veering into you know everybody thinks their issue is the most important, but if so. You make a statement during a meeting and it may or may not make it into the minutes, you know, because maybe, or it may just be, but you, if you feel you really want to have something be part of the record of the meeting or the deliberation is the way to do that by submitting something in writing. 
I guess that's part of, and maybe that's, this isn't the place for that discussion, but you know, if, if you want to make sure something is part of the written record of a meeting or of a deliberation on a whole topic, is that when you would prepare a written statement, you know, for, um, to be submitted as part of the record? And is that something that our process allows to happen? And is that relevant to this discussion, this paragraph? Any comment, Athena? No, okay, I'm gonna to go to Michelle. I'll just quickly say, I have seen in other meetings and other uh, communities as well as um, at higher levels where a counselor will request that something is added to the record. Um, and I don't think we have a process for that uh, currently. And so if, we're, if we'd like to create a process for that, that might be the discussion to have. That's an interesting idea, and we would want Athena included in that process discussion. Um, Mandy, and then- I, I was gonna say the same thing, but it I think it's a separate discussion and would have to be yeah. a separate rule, and so should come wherever we would put that um, with some potential language. Yes. Lynn? I think this goes on the list for conversation with KP Law. Yeah. I'd love to see us get real clear on this because of the yeah. number of times it's arisen and it feels very murky. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Anybody else? Jennifer, your hand was up, but I think you had finished. I, I think if that gets added to the KP law question and we get, can address it at a future time, that would be Thank you. Great. Uh, can I add one more thing before we move on? Yes. If there is a rule change that allows uh, counselor opinion to be made part of the written record, we would need to be really clear about when those opinions are made available to counselors, that they would have to be made available to the public at the same time that they're made available to counselors. And then there it would be some challenges in terms of naturally counselors would have opinions about other counselors opinions and we can't get into a back and forth outside a meeting you know someone has su submitted a, an opinion and now someone else has an opinion about that opinion and does that become part of it so yeah it's a very slippery slope as you said before yeah on many levels uh, including staff time and preparing, you know, packets and things like that in a timely manner. Um, I think we've done a fairly decent job of this list. Um, and it is now, let me see, uh, just uh, about 10 minutes after 11. So I'd like to take, I guess, the next 15 minutes and start to go through uh, the document the actual rules and procedures that have been written lined and does that make sense to folks? Yeah, and I've got probably, I don't know if I have a full half hour in me. <laughs> so we're gonna pretty much uh, stop on a dime closer to 11.30. Jennifer, you have to leave it right two minutes before 11.30, so. yeah. I think that's a good time for us to all to stop. <laughs> so on this one, I think uh, moving through page by page makes some sense. Or are there clusters that, I mean, I think the clusters are within the uh, um, topic headings, the uh, rules headings. So. Um, we have on, I don't know what page that is right now, but on rule two on organization, the election of officers, I guess I'm also going to ask is if, if one of the uh, us on GOL requested um, a change or an addition or a deletion to, um, to sh if you're comfortable sharing your name with that, the other, the other document didn't have names, 
but it's sometimes helpful to to have that like this is why I put this in here um, or or not. So um, I will go with how people are comfortable. Jennifer and then Michelle. Well, I just have a question about this. Is this meant so the the meeting it would be the last meeting of the prior calendar year? Yeah. And and so people uh, who wanted to run would kind of declare their candidacy then. The only yeah. I mean, I'm just asking, and then yes, that's could, what I yeah. think it and says. Could, they, could somebody decide between the December meeting and the January meeting that they wanted to run? And so I'm just wondering some clarification here. Yeah. And again, if if anyone here wrote this, then they'd be the best answering person to answer that. Michelle, that's me. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I Jennifer, I tried to to also add language about it not precluding other things, and then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to, in my mind, no, it doesn't mean that between that meeting and the next meeting, someone who spoke out and to announce a candidacy couldn't back out. It doesn't mean that another person couldn't come forward. It's simply to, and this comes from my own personal experience, um, when I uh, decided to run for vice president, I didn't feel comfortable calling colleagues to announce that because I was concerned that I would violate open meeting law. Um, and so I didn't have the opportunity to share my reasoning or anything. And so I thought this would be an opportunity that if a counselor knew they wanted to run for one of those offices um, or those positions, they could um, have the opportunity in a public setting to express that to the council and maybe even get feedback from their colleagues about it. Um, so that that was really the impetus of this one. And I also wanted to say that Lynn actually did include this year a meeting prior to that meeting in which we had some brief discussion about the upcoming election. Um, so I was really trying to sort of uh, enshrine that and just further define. Um, and I like the language you used about announcing candidacy in a way, like it's just to kind of formalize that possibility for a counselor. Any reactions to that, uh, Mandy? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I appreciate the explanation. Uh, Michelle, for for the reasons and and the uh, the acknowledgement that at least the first half of this is sort of already done on a regular basis, right? Um, I I don't know. I I want to hear more from others um, about the second half of this. Um, what Michelle says sounds good, yet I also worry. Um, the officer selection of the council by the counselors is sort of an internal choice. Um, and I worry about the potential for external pressure if candidacies are announced and, and, and think about the timing of this. If candidacies are announced a week before the holiday season, and the external pressure or what might happen, or pressure might be the wrong word, the external um, indicators that might come in over a holiday season um, when we're trying to take a break from council work um, regarding a counselor's own decision on who to potentially vote for. Um, and I don't know whether that's something we should or should not be concerned about. Um, I know KP Law has indicated that this really is just an internal decision of the council um, versus an external decision. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear more people's thoughts on that, um, on sort of that. And then if someone does decide to withdraw, say, does it make it more likely? Or if someone hasn't decided, does it, you know, how does this affect even individual counselors' own decisions on whether to run or not, if they've already said and announced publicly they were running, but then decided to say pull out, but had received, but the council received, say, a lot of emails that says, yes, elect that person. You know, what kind of pressure does it put on individual counselors? So I just want to hear more about it. Lynn? Lynn? 
You're muted, Lynn. Uh, that's, thank you. Uh, I'd like to have a period put at the end of agenda to discuss the upcoming election. Because as others have recognized, that has been the practice actually for the last right. several years. I think the second part for some of the very same reasons Mandy Jo just mentioned, um, you know, it, it is a council decision. And yet I could see whether I don't care if it's a holiday or whose holiday it is, I could see the public jumping into this in a way that may or may not be healthy. And that's my, my concern. But one of the uh, one of the ways to think about this would be to say, I'm considering it versus I am doing it. Uh, so that one could do that. That, however, will not take away the public pressure that could arise. Michelle? Yeah. Um... I respectfully disagree that the public pressure during whatever period of time is something that we should consider when considering this. Um, I am curious about hearing that it's an internal decision. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused actually about what that means, but regardless of those things, coming back to um, there are counselors who will feel more comfortable calling around and telling each of their colleagues that they are planning to run. And I know that that has been, that has happened. Um, and that puts a person who maybe doesn't have that same comfort level in doing that um, in, I think, a position that uh, is just not equitable. And so I'm trying to solve that problem within the confines of open meeting law. So um, how does a person who wants to announce to their colleagues, um, so it's not a surprise on the day of, um, and share that it's not about, for example, uh, disdain or disrespect for the current folks or even to get feedback, you know, like, well, you know, whatever feedback uh, uh, colleagues may have in a respectful environment, how can that happen for a counselor like me who I just didn't, I felt very scared to make those calls um, that, that I would be in violation. And it is, I think that it is a violation ultimately to do that. And so how do we solve that problem? Um, I think Jennifer was next. Yes, I, I agree with, I do agree, you know, share Michelle's concern. I mean, I think it brings it out into the open by having the opportunity, you know, to um, announce it, at, you know, publicly beforehand, because otherwise it seems like there's kind of a scrambling in the few days before the first meeting. I, I mean, it just seems, and in a sense, if who, you know, whoever is currently, let's say in a president or vice president position, it's known that they're a candidate so it kind of puts someone who may also want to run not in this maybe an equal footing. So I, I do think that if there's another way to do it, but I, I do think having trans, I'm not saying there should be another way that this, this is how we may want to do it, you know, on the understanding that if somebody decides between the last meeting of the year and the election that they can still, you know, throw their hat in the ring. But I think it does make it more transparent because Otherwise, there is a kind of, I think it just sets up where there's no other choice, but there to be sort of rumblings under the surface. And somebody talking to this person, I just think it for the, again, for transparency and putting everyone who would be interested in running for the position of president and vice president on equal footing. Uh, Lynn? Um, 
so I'm going to make a suggestion. And I am also want to just respond to Michelle's um, comment. The reality is that if we wanted the president to be elected by the public, our elections would be very different. And we don't have that provision at this time. Um, that's what would happen if there was a mayor. Uh, the mayor would be elected and then the public elects the mayor. Um, there's any number of ways to be approached that. So let me try something and just say, at that same meeting, those who may wish to run for president and or vice president, it's not a continuation. Well, maybe it can be, I don't think. President or vice president. Um, shall have the opportunity to address their colleagues. I have to also say to you, um, I don't think there's anything in our present process of meetings that would have prevented this anyway. But um, that's that's my suggested way of incorporating this. Okay. I'm gonna uh, take a moment to say something and then I'll call on you, Jennifer. I feel like the process that we have had works. Um, I don't see the need. Um, I, I hear, you know, Michelle talking about uh, shyness and concern, you know, feeling nervous about doing it. I'm not sure how doing it the week, the meeting before changes that because you still have to make those statements. And I'm just like trying to figure this out. But it seems like um, this, it just feels like we're taking something that has been working, that everybody who wishes to run for those positions, including the current uh, people in them, are speaking for, uh, to the council who are making the decision when we go to that election. So I, I feel like this, this is not necessary. Um, but that's that's where I am right now. And uh, Jennifer, you I think you had your hand up, but I'm going to go to Michelle because I don't see Michelle and then Mandy. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear. I wasn't talking about being shy to make a statement. I'm no. talking about um, not calling up colleagues before and letting them know that I'm running. I you. Pat, you were saying that this is a, the process has been working. And what I'm sharing as a colleague and a counselor is that it didn't work for me um, because I didn't feel like I could call up my colleagues and tell them that I was planning to run. Whereas, and again, I'm sorry, I really don't want to make this personal, but I know that that was that's not been the case for other counselors. Um, and so I feel like that's an unfair it, I mean, I can go ahead, I could go ahead, I guess, and just do it. But I think that that's not I think Athena would agree that that is a violation of open meeting law to do that. Well, that's what I was going to go to, Michelle. So thank you for calling on Athena because I'd like to hear from her yeah. about whether it's a violation um, making those phone calls. Athena? Speaking with individual counselors outside of a meeting is not a violation of open meeting law. What we can't do is for counselors to go, I'm running and these people are voting for me and share an, uh, you know, an informal poll um, outside a meeting. So there is a degree of trust about what that, what those conversations are like and that um, when those discussions happen outside meetings that counselors not be polling each other and then sharing what those polls 
are outside meetings. Mm -hmm. Does that, Michelle, can, do you have a reaction to that? I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think a, a possible, possibly a sort of distinguishing fact that not all counselors would be aware of. It's very nuanced. Um, and so if that is the case, um, then uh, I, I think that there shall be trust between colleagues that that wouldn't. So maybe the answer is um, for the council, current council president at the time during that meeting that's already been occurring, just to simply explain that um, so that folks who are considering it understand very clearly what they can and cannot do. And I would be very comfortable with that. If I don't know how to enshrine that necessarily so that, you know, in the, for future councils, it would, uh, cause it is so nuanced. So I have, that's, concern. that's an excellent, uh, compromise, Michelle. It really is. And I think that we could add language to the election thing about that statement needing to be uh, when there, the announcement is made that they, there will be an upcoming election, that the statement be made about open meeting and polling and, and things like that. I think that, in that if that were there, that would have solved the issue for you very clearly, I think. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. Um, I'm gonna go to Mandy. I know we're almost out of time. Um, I think that is a good compromise. Michelle, I've been in your position, um, not just for vice presidency in running again, but also for running for president against our current president. Um, and I've also been in the position when I've chosen as a vice president to not run again. And how do you let colleagues know that you are not running again too? Um, you know, and so, I think if if we would announce those rules, maybe, um, but not the regular meeting immediately prior to, a lot of the consideration goes in and thought goes in well before that happens. And so I wonder if we think about what meeting is the most appropriate meeting for that. Maybe it's not the last meeting of the calendar year. Maybe it's the first meeting in December or something like that, especially if it would start to include rules and all. And and. You know, I still have to think about this, but but potentially allow, um, you know, this this op it, uh, one of my concerns is the opportunity to address colleagues. But but it's also that wishing, you know, that that announcement. But maybe there's a way to word it that it's more of instead of wishing to run or intending to run, who is considering running or not running? Um, you know, and and make it a little more informal without necessarily the need for a statement before the election. I think that that concerns me versus if it was just a poll and people essentially raised their hands. Yeah, I'm thinking about running for president. You know, I, I could have raised my hand multiple times <laughs> in this past year about that, right? You know, and, and if it's not as formal with having to come up with that statement before the day of the election, it might not be seen as, as much of by the public as a, firm out, here are your two candidates or your three candidates. And that's one of the things I worry about is that it's seen as the candidacy is set. Um, and I think that addressing the colleagues might further that, that look versus just sort of taking that raw poll of, is anyone considering running for vice president this year? Um, and less of a line in the sand. I think that's also a good suggestion. I feel very good about the collaboration that's happened in this discussion. Um, Athena, very quickly, and I know Jennifer, you may have to leave already. Uh, it is 11.30. Oh, sorry, just one really quick other yes, comment. Yes, no, go ahead, Athena. Um, that the onus is not just on the candidate, but other counselors hearing. Right. If we hear about who's running during a meeting or outside a meeting, that there's not a discussion and sharing who's voting which way outside a meeting. So that's on everyone for upholding the meeting law and trusting that we're all upholding the meeting law outside meetings. <clears throat> Thank you, Athena. That was, that's a good way to close. What I'd like to do is pick up 
this discussion right where we are now at the beginning of our next meeting and um, and and work through from there. I really, as I just said, I really appreciate what happened and I feel like there was compromise. And unless there's an objection, I'm uh, adjourning the meeting at 11. Excellent chaired meeting. Great. Nice job, we'll Pat. See. We'll see. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you all Thanks. for your help. Every one of you helped today. Thank you. And Athena. Bye. And thank you, you Athena. Yeah. Yeah. Take care.